That trailer you all just saw really puts a human face to the topic we're all about to discuss, human capital. And in this case, the tragedy and reality that there are so many people around the world who are unable to tap into their potential. The sustainable development agenda promises to leave no one behind. So it's critical that efforts to achieve the sustainable development goals also enhance the opportunities for everyone to participate, emphasizing again everyone, including the very poorest. Across New York City this week, as you all know, conversations you've been a part of, there are calls to action for leadership to achieve the sustainable development goals. But if we're trying to solve problems as complex as end poverty in all its forms, the people who are closest to those problems are best positioned to solve them. That's what we're going to be talking about today. The World Economic Forum defines human capital endowment as the knowledge and skills embodied in individuals that enable them to create economic value. And in its human capital report, the World Economic Forum says that this human capital endowment is the single most important determinant of a nation's long-term success. And yet, it's so undervalued. So that's why we're talking about investing in human capital as a model for change here at We the Future. At DevEx, I take a solutions journalism approach to global development. And the approaches that really seem to me to be working are those that flip the script on foreign aid so that beneficiaries become agents of change. Today, you're going to hear about four examples of that. We'll start with Team Rubicon. I've had the pleasure of visiting Team Rubicon headquarters in Los Angeles, and you really feel the culture that has put them on the map in terms of disaster response. In fact, the poster that caught my eye says, get shit done. <laughs> had to make sure I was allowed to say that. <laughs> Team Rubicon has veterans around the world ready to answer the call veterans who are going to deploy on missions where they are able to heal as much as they are able to help communities. And with that, I want to introduce Jake Wood, co-founder and CEO of Team Rubicon. Thanks, Jake. Over the course of the last four weeks, I've spent most of my time on the ground at the Gulf Coast of Texas, helping our teams as they respond to the terrible tragedies that have unfolded as a result of Hurricane uh, Harvey. Uh, we initially started with six Swiftwater rescue teams on the ground, and they assisted the authorities in Harris County with pulling hundreds of individuals off of their roofs and out of their homes and into safety. Since that time, in that initial week, we've deployed over 1,000 military veterans into the Gulf Coast region to begin helping neighborhoods, the most socially vulnerable neighborhoods that were impacted by this storm, begin on their road to recovery. And we have plans to deploy thousands more. Now, unfortunately, Mother Nature has not given us any respite. <coughs> And we've had to deploy teams into three cities along the coast of Florida. Yesterday, we deployed a search and rescue team into Mexico to assist with the earthquake there. And we are currently evaluating the situation in Puerto Rico. Now, I wasn't always a humanitarian. In fact, a decade ago, I was actually running counterinsurgency patrols in the, the uh, Triangle of Death in Iraq's Anbar province. The following year, nine years ago in 2008, I was working in a scout sniper team hunting Taliban insurgents in the Helmand River Valley. In fact, my colleagues today in the humanitarian space often have difficulty rationalizing my, my past life with the current work that I do. But the reality is that the wars of today have changed, and with them, the soldiers and the Marines who are fighting those wars have had to change as well. And we often find uh, our militaries teaching these, these young soldiers that the, the power of educating a young girl or the power of giving a young man a job in battling extremism and violence. And the reality is that our, our, as the battlefields have shifted and changed, uh, our, our warriors and the strategies and tactics have had to change with it. And we now find ourselves with militaries who see as much value in nation building and promoting peace in keeping security and stability in today's world. Now, I didn't realize at the time when I was serving in the US Marine Corps that my life as a warrior would soon intersect with my future, uh, my future life as a humanitarian. But that happened, unfortunately, in January 2010 when a devastating earthquake hit the nation of Haiti. I found myself helping to organize a team, working with a friend, William McNulty, a handful of other Marines, my college roommate, Jeff Lang, and a handful of doctors. It was actually uh, almost like the start of a bad joke as a couple of Marines, a flamboyant doctor, and a Jesuit priest walked into Haiti. Uh, 
But we got down on the ground, and we began immediately providing medical triage work in different parts of, of Port-au-Prince, parts of Port-au-Prince that were uh, too dangerous to go even before one of the world's worst humanitarian crises. And as we were down on the ground, we realized that everything that we were doing was simply using the skills and experiences that the Marine Corps had taught us to help people on their worst day. And what I also realized is just because my time in uniform was over, just because I had left the military didn't mean that my desire to serve had left me, didn't mean that the skills that I had learned could no longer be of use to mankind. And so we came back and we decided to incorporate this idea, this concept, into a nonprofit organization called Team Rubicon, with the goal of building a new kind of disaster response organization by using a new kind of human capital recruiting the men and women from Western militaries around the world to use their skills to help people in their greatest moments of need. And what we realized was that the challenges that we were facing were, were almost overpowering. The reality is that the frequency and cost of natural disasters around the world have been increasing at a frightening rate, and we've heard that plenty of times yet today. Last year alone in the United States, insurable losses as a result of natural disasters eclipsed $20 billion, and twice that amount, $40 billion in uninsured losses. The cost estimates to recover from Hurricane Harvey and Hurricane Irma range from 150 to nearly $300 billion. The costs are devastating, and we have to find a better way. Almost uh, completely separate from that, we've had three million men and women in the United States who have come home from service overseas since 9-11. These are men and women with a tremendous amount of skills, but most importantly, they still have a desire. They are in pursuit of a new mission in life as they come home, leave the military, and enter into civilian society in our communities throughout this country. These are men and women who have, we've, we've put a, a ton of, uh, developed a lot of skills into. They have skills in leadership, logistics, operational planning, risk mitigation. They have medical skills. They've had to hone these skills in some of the toughest environments imaginable. They've had to perform these skills under the duress of combat. They've uh, been used to using advanced technologies to enable their mission at, at large scale. And when they come back, they still have these. Now, the reality is that the U.S. taxpayer has invested a tremendous amount of money into these individuals. We have put taxpayer dollars to train these people. You paid $45,000 on average for the basic U.S. Marine, $320,000 for a West Point cadet, $2 million for a Navy SEAL, $6 million for a Navy fighter pilot. But when these individuals leave the military and go back to their communities across this country, we don't ask for a continued return on that investment. Now, how much sense does that make? And so over the last seven and a half years, I'm sorry, what it, what the question that this begs is if the 100 and 3,000 military veterans in the city of Houston had been organized and trained and equipped in advance of Hurricane Harvey making landfall, how might the initial 96 hours of that disaster played out differently? And that's what Team Rubicon has been doing over the last seven and a half years, recruiting and organizing and training these military veterans to serve, con to continue their service in their communities, giving them the opportunity to rediscover that sense of purpose and community and identity in doing so, providing opportunities for us to increase the readiness and resilience of communities, not just in the United States, but around the world. And we've seen a tremendous amount of success initially as we've had these efforts. We've scaled from those initial eight volunteers who made their way down into Port-au-Prince to over 60,000 volunteers in the U.S. here alone, 3,000 volunteers in the United Kingdom, over 1,000 volunteers in our new organization in Australia. The opportunities ahead of us are amazing. And over the course of the last eight years, those volunteers have responded to over 200 crises around the world, ranging from refugee, uh, the refugee crisis to epidemics in Africa to uh, natural disasters and catastrophes in the United States, in uh, South America, in Asia. And it, we have to ask ourselves the question, as we look at the future of this world and we see all the challenges in front of us, as we see our, the cities that we call home under attack by Mother Nature, how is it that we can rethink paradigms when it comes to human capital to increase the resilience and the readiness of these communities so that we can meet those challenges head on? Team Rubicon is challenging us to rethink the norms and, and the conflict between the humanitarian space and the military space. Two organizations, two spaces that have commonly not seen eye to eye, but where as we look forward towards the future, there is an opportunity to understand and to realize that the military veterans that we have spent so much time and money 
training to respond in some of the toughest situations imaginable may just have a role to play as we look to increase the resilience of our world in the face of this climate change. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jake. And uh, I know all of you probably have questions. I should note our speakers will be around all day today, but I'm going to ask this first question. Just one. Just one. We'll see how much we have time for. Um, you know, we've known each other for a few years, and in the last five years, Team Rubicon has scaled from 2,000 volunteers to 60,000 volunteers, which is a, a kind of scale that is both admirable and challenging, I'm sure. So can you talk us through how, as you've scaled, uh, you've dealt with the challenge, lessons you've learned, and also how you've kept what makes Team Rubicon Team Rubicon as you move country to country? Yeah, I, I think what we see is that the, the, the challenges that we're addressing are, are massive, right? And I, and I think that what we've tapped into is the desire by these three million men and women to continue to serve. Mm -hmm. and we've simply provided them an outlet that, that makes them feel valued, that utilizes the skills that they already have, and, and we've, we've, so we've coupled that with this vision, this vision that you know, we can impact the world, we can help our neighbors, whether they're our neighbors across town or across the world, mm -hmm. help them on their worst day when they need us most. And we've been able to take that vision and then build a culture around it that, you know, as you said, uh, helps us get shit done in, in really challenging and complicated environments. Mm -hmm. And so I think you know, people want to rise up to those types of challenges, whether they were in the military or not. Mm -hmm. And we've just been able to tap into that I, mean, I like to say we just haven't screwed it up yet, mm -hmm. um, but really the, the work remains ahead of us and, and we're excited to, to take it on. So one other question for you quickly. Uh, in reporting on Team Rubicon for DevX, um, one of the things that came across is that the humanitarian sector and military don't always uh, collaborate as effectively mm -hmm. as you might hope. And how have you worked through that challenge? I think it'd be a good message on collaboration. Yeah, it, it's absolutely been a challenge. And you know, the, the humanitarian space and the military space have been at odds for very good reasons throughout history. And, and I, I certainly can understand why the, those two have not always seen eye to eye. Um, it, what we have tried to do, and, and, and we've learned, and taken, learned some lessons and taken some bumps along the way, is to approach this space with some humility. Mm -hmm. like, I think we are bringing much to the table. I think there are a lot of skills that our volunteers have. I think we're being pretty innovative when it comes to the use of technology. But at the end of the day, there are, there are actors in this space who have been doing this for a lot longer. Mm -hmm. There's a lot that we can learn. And collectively, we all just have to understand that the issues that we're facing are bigger than any organization or any current sector can tackle alone. Mm -hmm. And so if we don't collaborate, you know, we'll, we'll die. That's a great way to end it. Thank you, Jake. Yeah, thank you. So this is a line I actually borrowed directly from the organization you're about to hear about because I couldn't have put it into better words myself. In classrooms across Africa, stories are being written and futures are being rescued by girls anxious to learn and young women ready to lead. And the reason I love that line is because it's not the organization talking about what it does for others, but how it enables others to do this work and how they're solving the problems for themselves. Dolores Dixon, our next speaker, is the youngest of seven children, and her parents saw, an edu her saw education as a way to open doors for her. She's gone on to use education as a way to open doors for others. It's my pleasure to introduce Dolores Dixon, Executive Director of CAMFED West Africa. Thanks, Dolores. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Catherine. Have you ever wondered why people sometimes refer to Africa as Mama Africa? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Yeah, because women play a very important role in bringing up the next generation. And we know that educating girls is the beginning of empowering women to be able to do this. I joined Comfort 10 years ago to lead the Ghana program. And I've had the privilege and the opportunity to go on some amazing journeys, sometimes very challenging, but rewarding journeys with girls and young women. This is how the Comfort model works. We work mainly in deprived communities where girls have little or no chance of getting an education. And we support the girls with the financial support, the psychosocial support that they need to be able to access education, to stay in school and complete. Once the girls complete school, they join our unique alumni network called KAMA. 
The Karma Network provides peer support for the girls to continue to use their education to empower themselves. It also provides a platform where they can begin to practice and develop their leadership and their agency. And finally, it gives an opportunity of a critical mass of girls to come together and reinvest the benefits of their education back into their communities. But let us recognize that the context in which a girl lives determines and influences who she can become. And as a result, in our work, we work very closely with the communities, with the families, with the government, and also with the parents to ensure that we're able to create an enabling environment that encourages girls to succeed. So for example, when we work with the school and the head of the school decides that, they're going to change the policy. So now girls can take on leadership and become the head prefect, a position that was previously reserved for only boys. That is significant because that gives girls an opportunity to start practicing their leadership. It gives them the opportunity to be able to think about what they can become, to build their confidence. And who knows, maybe they can become the next leader of their country. So in 2008, I met a young lady called Hawa. She had just joined our program and had started secondary school. And Hawa told me that she was the first ever girl in her community to ever get to secondary school. And because of that, she's a village champion. And because of her, other parents want to see their daughters just be like her. Today, as I speak, Hawa has completed school. She has started her own business in her own community because she wants to reinvest back into her community and really um, build her local economy. She stood for elections, local elections, and she won. And she's one of only three women who sits on the local assembly of 53 people. She is doing amazing things for her community. She has lobbied to build a school. She has brought clean water to her community. And she's providing financial literacy education for women and grants so that they can also start businesses. And this is the story of one. We have 100,000 young women in the Kama Network. And each and every one of them is doing what they can to lead their community. Kama members support on average two children who are not related to them through school. And last year alone, they supported nearly 250,000 children on the African continent to go to school. That is double the number that CAMFED directly supported with donor funding. And this is the multiplier effect of girls' education. And this is how we can transform a continent. So it's no cliche when we say that when you educate a girl, everything changes. Thank you. Thanks, Dolores. So one thing I really love about the CAMFED model and want you to tell us a little bit more about is that you pay attention to the context in which a girl learns. Um, it's not just about providing the education, but addressing the larger systemic issues. And if you could just expand for a moment, when we talk about the context and the systemic challenges and the barriers that stand in the way of, of, of a girl getting an education, what, what are some of the challenges you're facing and how are you overcoming them? Yes, there are so many barriers facing girls just being able to access education. Mm -hmm. um, we have issues of child marriage, early and child marriage. We have issues of pregnancies. We have issues of um, children, just um, girls particularly, just leading um, households, mm -hmm. child-headed households. So there's so many barriers that prevent girls from just getting access to education. But what we've realized in our work is that when you look at all these issues, fundamentally, the issues are related to poverty, mm -hmm. because parents have to make a choice. When poor parents just have just enough to take one child to school and mm -hmm. they have a boy and a girl, they have to make a choice. Mm -hmm. And the choices that they make would, is always determined by the value that they feel that this 
pro provides to them. So you can see that p there's less value placed on girls' education, more value placed on boys' education. And when you do ask parents, and we've asked parents, why are you marrying off your child? Mm. They don't come and say that I'm marrying them off because I culturally believe that, but they do give you reasons like I'm marrying them off because I need to be able to support them. They love their children. They feel this is the only option mm. that we have under this circumstance. I'm marrying her off because she would be in a safer place. She would, be, she would have somebody to take care of her. I don't have to worry about her. And I would marry her off at 13 because I feel that if she gets to 16, she's going to find a suitor. Mm. And that would mean she might get pregnant and, drop and bring a baby to the house and I won't be able to take care of the baby and all that. So they feel that they are making the most rational decisions under the circumstances. Right. And so I think that the fundamental issues here are how we address the issues of poverty. Mm -hmm. How does comfort come in? And we work very closely with the community so that we can really appreciate and understand the real challenges that are going on so that we can come in behind the solutions. And some of the solutions that we come in with the investments in mm -hmm. girls' education so that parents don't have to face these tough decisions and to make these tough decisions. Absolutely, and one of the things we discussed in, in preparing for today was how this comma network model that you mentioned, I think it takes it a bit, a bit further in our discussion from beneficiary to change maker to champion. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a model we can all learn from. Definitely, and I think that the Kama Network has grown organically out of this program. Mm -hmm. It's um, a peer network, and what it's done is that right from the onset, it's given girls the empowerment to believe that they can reinvest back the benefits of their education into their communities and bring about the change that they want to see, and it's been a very powerful um, observation has been a very powerful network that is doing just that on the continent. So we're really excited about the potential of what it can achieve. Thank you, Dolores. So now we return to Myanmar, which is on many of our minds given the talk we heard earlier, as well as what we're all reading in the news. Debbie Ongdin Taylor is the co-founder of Proximity Designs, and she is all about proximate leadership, getting close to the problems you're trying to solve since we all know that problem solving from a distance doesn't work quite as effectively. Please welcome Debbie to the stage. So I come from Myanmar, and we're going through some very dark and difficult times right now. Myanmar is one of the poorest countries in the world. It's also been one of the most isolated we were, up until a few years ago, we were second to North Korea in terms of connectivity and isolation. So we run a creative design company in Myanmar. Uh, 13 years ago, my husband and two children moved back, and um, we set up Proximity Designs to help rural families become more prosperous. We create products like soil testing services and irrigation um, pumps. We focus on family farms because they're the backbone of the economy. They contribute to about 40% of the GDP and employ two-thirds of the labor force. Not only that, they um, produce most of the food the country eats. Yet the tragedy is that uh, they've been neglected and left behind for decades. Um, they lack basic technologies, know-how, and capital to be more productive. Um, this is true of a, of a lot of small farms across developing countries in the world. There's an estimated 450 million households like this. Meanwhile, um, in global agriculture, things are getting more capital intensive and precise. We've entered the next technological era called precision agriculture. Large farms across the US and uh, Europe and Australia are using data from sensors um, to become more profitable, sustainable, and efficient. And back in um, um, places like Myanmar, we're still using the rope and bucket and planting by hand. And this is an analog moisture sensor. If you want to know whether you need to irrigate, you take a clump of mud, and if it disintegrates, then uh, it's time to water your crops. So I want to talk about the three ways we work to help rural families become more prosperous. The first is that we use human-centered design or user-centered design. 
And by that, I mean we center our design and innovation around the human beings who will use our products. So it sounds simple enough, but it's a rigorous process that requires a lot of um, in-depth field research, um, rapid prototyping, and constant iteration. It takes deep knowledge and empathy to solve a complex problem like poverty, um, and it's hard to do from far away. So we get very close to our customers, and we engage with them throughout the year with our products and services. We have thousands of conversations with them, and we try to discover not only what they're doing and how they're doing it, but why they're doing it. It's really important to understand their needs and aspirations. So when we first started, we had a $40 metal pump that we thought was pretty affordable. It was a tenth of the price that was uh, for pumps in the uh, marketplace. But farmers kept giving us brutally honest feedback and said, can you make it lighter? Can you make it cheaper? So we kept prototyping um, with farmers and they're getting their input. And uh, we came up with a baby elephant pump. It's a... Uh, uh, I think it's the only one like it in the world. It's very lightweight and simple to use. Uh, women and children like to use it, and it costs only $18. Um, we've sold over 50,000 of these. So the second way we work is that we treat people as customers, and they're not charity recipients or aid beneficiaries. Um, it's a relationship of mutual exchange and power. And um, you see, if you give something away free, you never know whether it's used or valued. And uh, here the customer decides and, um, whether something we're providing is valuable to them or not. Um, where if they don't like the price or product, they simply don't buy it. And we're held directly accountable, and uh, we get immediate feedback. So over the last 13 years, we've um, helped 2.7 million people, or 555 thousand um, households uh, through our products and services. And uh, they typically are able to earn extra incomes of $250 a year. And the top three uses of their extra income have been um, more food for the family, better diets, and secondly, reinvesting in their farms, and third, to keep their kids in school. But we don't only design for uh, impact. Um, we design to transform lives and delight our customers. So I met a farmer um, in the Delta, in the Irrawaddy Delta, in a village, and uh, he was saying that he used to be too poor to farm. He couldn't afford the equipment. And so what he did was climb tall palm trees, and he would tap the toddy palm juice. And these palm juice tappers are typically the bottom rung of the, of the social ladder in villages. And he was saying that he was never invited to um, village ceremonies or celebrations because he was considered too poor to contribute. And one day he fell out of a tree and broke his back. So he was desperate to feed, figure out how to feed his family. And he came across our foot pump, and it was perfect uh, with his bad back. He only needed a treadle. And so he bought a, was able to buy the pump and started cultivating a small plot of vegetables around his house. And he said he made the most money he ever did in his life. And he said, you know, I used to be a nobody, but now I'm somebody. But the line that really got me was when he said, I am so happy I could do cartwheels in front of the entire village. <laughs> <laughs> so... For the next three to five years, we have ambitious plans to help another five million people uh, or a million family farms. And while we have customers in over 10,000 villages across Myanmar, and we're working at the micro level to remove barriers to creativity and entrepreneurship, we also work at the macro level. We use our intimate knowledge and research of the country, and we engage leaders um, on pressing issues facing the country. So it's been really important for us to work at the micro and the macro level to affect change. Um, I want to tell you what keeps us going during these dark and difficult times. Uh, this is um, Umal Maun, and uh, he's 80 years old, and this is his oldest son. Um, he was telling me that for most of his adult life, 
He was a landless laborer. And since he was 15 years old, he hauled water for other people's fields. And, um, but a few years ago, he took a bet on our products, and he rented a small plot of land, and he began growing his own crops. And he did well. He started using our drip irrigation and our other products. And today, he owns eight acres and employs 30 farm workers. And this is his latest um, purchase from us. It's a solar-powered irrigation pump. And as he was talking, um, he was saying that for most of his life, um, when he was hauling water, he said he would sweat so much that he could wring out the sweat from his wet sarong in the hot sun. And he said nowadays, his sole job is to sit under the shade tree and drink tea and every now and then, he gets up and adjusts the solar panels. <laughs> and as we were talking, he got a phone call from his youngest son in the Capitol. And uh, he takes out his brand new smartphone. And I could hear him bragging about his modern, new, quiet solar pump. And uh, as he got off, he um, started asking me, you know, what other technologies are there for farmers like him from around the world? And he said, you know, I know we've entered a new era, and I know I have a lot of catching up to do. And with all his youthful enthusiasm, he says, but I say, bring it on. <laughs> so um, it's farmers like Uma Maun who inspire us to keep going um, in this difficult task of building a nation that can someday be democratic, fair, prosperous, and inclusive for all. Thank you. So I love when there are these moments where concepts we talk about become real. And for me, this is the perfect example of we talk about designing not just for needs, but for aspirations, case in point. So thank you for your work. First question for you. We talk a lot about human-centered design in the global development sector. It's really become a buzzword. And yet, we're not seeing that approach taken as widely as it needs to be taken to achieve the kind of change we want to see with the SDGs. So any advice for this audience or those watching online about steps they can take individually or as organizations to incorporate some of the same approaches? Yeah, I think it'd be great to ask ourselves two questions. Um, I don't think we're doing design just for innovation's sake. I think mm -hmm. it's important to be clear that we're designing for impact. Mm -hmm. So the number one question is, what is the impact of your particular program, your intervention, your product, your service on that household and measure it? Mm -hmm. And secondly, um, what is the most cost-effective way to deliver that um, impact mm -hmm. and measure that and be able to compare across many interventions or products or services and be really rigorous about it? And um, I guess at a personal level, I think, I think uh, we can all grow in empathy Mm -hmm. And I think we can all be willing to listen mm -hmm. and engage people on their own terms um, and be willing to be held accountable and, um, yeah, be proximate. Any advice, when you, when you say be proximate, um, obviously you've followed that in your own life. You moved to Myanmar to work on these issues, to be close to these issues. And uh, throughout your career, formerly you actually worked in the aid sector. Um, you know, for the World Bank, the UN, and other agencies. Um, that, that's a sector where you sometimes are trying to solve problems far away. And I wonder, any advice for people on how to get proximate? Well, I think, um, I think we need to be willing to just spend a lot of time with the end user mm -hmm. and the human beings that are at the end of our programs mm -hmm. and, um, and just be open and flexible um, and not be afraid to make huge changes. Um, so Thank you. Great call yeah. to action. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you. So I'm going to start this next introduction with words straight from the Skoll World Forum stage back in 2014. Health workers deserve better tools, and communities deserve better care. Those are the words of our next speaker, the CEO of Medic Mobile. Health workers are at the center of everything that Medic Mobile does. Before building or deploying software, and that's what they're known for, they get to know the people who are going to use these tools. But Medic Mobile 
also leverages emerging technology to serve these health workers and help them to reach the hardest to reach communities. This next speaker is actually a neighbor of mine in San Francisco. We both work in San Francisco, but he works all over the world, and I know he has many lessons for all of us. So please welcome Josh Nesbitt to the stage. My eyes were opened when I met a doctor in Malawi who was responsible for 250,000 people. Patients were walking up to 100 miles to get to that hospital. During rainy season, there were three or four families sharing every bed in that pediatric ward. People were being systematically excluded from care. What I mean by that is that the system simply was not reaching those who were furthest away and poorest. My eyes were open and the burden was overwhelming. Then I met community health workers. I listened to them, I shadowed them, and like many before me, they changed my perspective. These are people who are doing everything in their power to provide care for their neighbors. They're from the communities that they serve, they're welcomed into homes and into lives, and they're there for patients in the most trying moments. Clearly, I had to rethink who a health worker was and how we supported them. And if they're health workers, what should the tools look like by their side? And what should the system look like that's designed with them and around them? We created Medic Mobile as a nonprofit technology company, and we committed to building world-class software for health workers in the hardest to reach communities. Today, we work with inspiring partners all over the world we support 20,000 health workers as they provide care for 11 million people. Every day, this network is finding and caring for 3,500 sick children in their homes. Every day, they're helping 200 women and their families deliver safely at a health facility with skilled care. And this network is global, and it's growing. Now we're following a community health worker in rural Nepal, as she does a home visit for a family with a woman who's pregnant in her community. These health workers have shown us that it is possible for systems to reach everyone. They've shown us time and time again that they can deliver high-quality care and services door-to-door, -door, if only we do our jobs. And that means making sure that they earn a living wage, that they have the essential medicines that they need, they have continuous training and supervision, and they have technology that's designed with them and for them. Medic Mobile expects to play our part. In the next year, we'll expand to serve 15,000 additional health workers. Within five years, our goal is that the software is supporting 200,000 health workers as they provide care for at least 100 million people. That scale-up is happening in the context where general trends for maternal mortality and child mortality are promising. We have multiple country models we can point to. But the truth is that political will, funding for delivery, and new ideas are still critical. In too many communities, one out of 10 children will not survive until the age of five. They will die before they turn five. That is normal. That status quo is unacceptable and unjust. And in order for the pace of progress to pick up, humans and machines have to work together. This is already happening. Smartphones and smart software is guiding health workers to the right families at the right time, and then helping them provide the right care. Managers can see a stream of information and visualizations to see what's happening in these homes and provide support for the right health workers. New diagnostics and home-based testing is decentralizing care and meeting people where they are. And it's up to us to ask and answer the question, what should this look like in the future? What if the software in the hands of these women could predict which child in their community is most likely to be sick? Or which family is most likely to miss their immunization visit? What if the software could build across 
millions of cases experienced to guide them on the course of action. And what if, as we need to roll out a new vaccine, or we have new treatments to provide, the software could onboard them to that new responsibility? When we think about humans and machines as a team, we're freed up to focus on strengths rather than shortcomings. For humans, we might design around our abilities to empathize and comfort, to recruit and to motivate, to act with courage and moral imagination. And we might ask machines for help with all of the math, complex logic, and learning across billions of data points. And if we take that approach, I think we'll stop the conversation about machines replacing humans in a workforce. And instead, we'll be designing systems that can reach everyone. We'll be designing systems that create millions of jobs because these systems are being redesigned and we're rethinking who a health worker is. I expect these systems to operate within the resource budget for our one Earth. And I expect that this human-machine team is the only way we'll meet ambitious goals for health equity locally, nationally, and globally. We believe it's important what we build, why we build it, how we build it, and who contributes. We must stand by those who are marginalized and often ignored and put technology to work for them. We must design with deep respect for our own humanity and actively bring humanity into the technology. And we must put these people first. We must live up to the daily ambition, the hope, and the grit of the people and the heroes on the front lines. Thank you. So this is actually a question I've been wanting to ask you for a while. Um, months ago, I wrote Josh an email and asked him a rather broad question, I'm sorry for such a big question, about the shifts underway in global health that he thought we should be focusing on. Um, and he wrote a very helpful email, seven different bullet points, and at the bottom you said, technology needs to accelerate and enable these shifts, not hold them back. And I've been wanting to ask, and our audience might like to know, what do you mean by that? So that's, that answer was really about technology creating space for the shifts that we've known had to happen for decades, mm -hmm. to people-centered care, to proactive care, these shifts that systems have been wanting to make, and from my view, technology was holding us back. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna jump ahead and say, also, we're at a point now that technologists need to think about the future we're, we're co-creating mm -hmm. with the people that we serve. And we have to come to terms with the fact that when we're building something that helps someone, as soon as we make that statement, we're into distribution ethics and mm -hmm. questions of distributive justice. We're talking about moral philosophy, we're talking about libertarianism mm -hmm. and egalitarianism and utilitarianism. And I want to jump right into those conversations because that's, uh, those are questions about the world we're going to create. And just to add on to that, how we build these things really matters. That was, that was my next question. So. Great. I'm really concerned about black boxes mm -hmm. for algorithms. Yeah. And prison systems we don't understand, mm -hmm. parole systems we don't understand. Global health cannot be the next thing we don't understand. And the systems shaping millions of people have to be clear uh, and open and the best they can be. Mm -hmm. So how we build these things matters. I wanted to ask you one more question, which I think a lot of people in this room, if they work in some of the same markets that Medic Mobile is working in, they feel that, um, you know, the emergence of AI is not really relevant to the context in which they work. You're based in San Francisco, but you work all over the world, and you see that connection, and you're acting on it now. So any advice for how people can navigate these shifts? It's a great question. I have two pieces of advice. The first is for people who live and work alongside those who should benefit from the technology, mm -hmm. just own the challenges and mm -hmm. own uh, your understanding of the daily lived experiences. Focus on that tell the whole world. Um, over time, technologists will find you and will find teams. Mm. The second thing that needs to happen is we need more uh, philanthropy and weird capital that's allocated to let the smartest technologies and sm smartest technologists focus on these types of problems. Um, until uh, we can't hope and wish yeah. that uh, the types of products that are built will apply because uh, it's too important to hope and just wish. 
Thank you, Josh. Thanks. Thanks. So I've talked with a lot of people about human capital and getting ready for this session. And one of the points that really resonated with me is when we talk about human capital, we often talk about health and education or perhaps preparing our workforce for the jobs of the future. But often the elephant in the room is this context, the power structures, and making sure that people have the ability to voice their opinions, to shape their lives, and to impact their communities. So when we talk about the kind of systemic change we need in order to achieve these global goals by 2030, we need to consider greater and more universal investment in human capital.